another episode of Ruddix Radio. This is a family-friendly show, so the entire family can join us as we talk metal detecting, relic, and treasure hunting. You can also call in to the show at 270-495-0315 or join in the chat and post any comments or questions you might have. Relix Radio is also now syndicated on goodtalkradio.com and has a show each Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. Arizona time. You're listening to Relics Radio of Southern Kentucky and Middle Tennessee. Goodness gracious, it's already Thursday again, and we're coming to you live out of Southern Kentucky and Middle Tennessee. Right here on Relics Radio, right along the foothills of the Cumberland Mountains, right along the most beautiful river in all of the country, the Cumberland River. I am your host, Digging with Seven. And I'm your co-host, Tennessee Jeff. And I tell you what, Jeff, I was afraid that uh, we would probably be dodging storms, but I don't think they're going to get here until about 10 o'clock our time, and it's only 7 o'clock our time now. May hit you a little bit quicker than that, but I think we're going to be able to get the show in uh, before any of that uh, takes place. Well, I sure hope so, because there that, that were some pretty bad storms uh, down in Mississippi, and our prayer, our thought and prayers go out to everyone down there that's uh, had any damage or anyone hurt. So, And I just hope we don't have the tornadic activity they had down there. Yeah, I know it. Uh, it's been an eventful week. There's no doubt about that, as... Uh, most of you know, uh, Dennis Grettencord came and uh, to hunt, and him and Jeff were hunting on Sunday. They were going to get together with me on Monday, but uh, Dennis had a heart attack, and I'll just let Jeff go ahead and tell the short version of that because he was there. Well, it was started, uh, we went to a colonial site of mine, and uh, we hunted for, uh, I guess, uh, maybe two or three hours, and uh, a buddy of mine uh couple of towns over he invited us to go on the civil war site so we left the uh, colonial site and as i was pulling out uh, i was spinning in some mud right next to the main road and i suppose i'd got into a, a broken piece of glass a bottle or something so we had to change a tire and of course as soon as we got the tire changed we uh, started heading uh, to the next hunt sites and he said his chest was hurting and make a long uh long story short we got to the hunt site and we left there maybe we were only there an hour because he was hurting so bad so we left and that's when we decided well we can't just pass this off as just any old uh strain muscle or anything like that so and then next thing you know he had a uh five uh, bypass heart surgery so yeah i went in Yeah, went in, uh, that was on Tuesday, went in on Tuesday, and I think they started about 2 o'clock. I talked to him then uh, on Wednesday, and I told him that uh, we were going to call him tonight, and uh, let me see if I can add Dennis in right here, Uh, get him on the line, and see, uh, I told him uh, that we'd like for him to uh, just say hello to everyone, and... uh, Dennis, are you there? I don't have him yet. He, he, Hello. Hey, Dennis. Yes, sir. Hey, Hello, Dennis. Bub, we're we're live on Relics Radio, and I told everybody that we were going to just try to give you a call and uh, then see uh, what uh, what the situation is now. How are you feeling? How are you getting along? Uh, pretty good. We're just... They just moved me up to a room. I'm out of ICU. Yay. So we're happy about that. And, uh, you know, feeling a little peaked, but not too bad. I imagine that you are. 
all that you've <laughs> all that you've gone through. Uh, yeah. Terrible situation that you uh, that you were that far away from home, and yet it could have been a lot worse, couldn't it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I was just glad you know Jeff was there, and we discussed it and did the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know uh, our second site we went to, and when we started to, uh, decided, well, we need to go to the ER. Actually, we were hunting uh, about a hundred yards from a hospital, and uh, yeah, yeah. of course, as uh, Dennis and he went back to the truck and he called me and said he, he was ready to go. A cop had pulled up and was like, "Well, have you, you guys finding anything?" And he's like, "Well, not really." He, of course, Dennis didn't. He wasn't able to hunt long there because of the uh, uh, chest pain. And so it, it just seemed like everything, everybody was there around him at that time that could have helped. So. Yep, absolutely. Well, we uh, we just wanted to holler at you tonight and give everybody a chance to uh, hear your voice and uh, know that you're still kicking and that things are, you're on the mend. And uh, we appreciate, yep. you, appreciate you coming on with us here tonight and, uh, I'll let you have the last word, and then you can get back to resting. Okay. I just want to thank everybody for all the kind words and the prayers. And it, it seemed uh, everything worked. So for on the mend, it'll be, uh, the doctor said, a couple months before I'm back to good as news. So it'll be, that's about it. Okay. <laughs> that's great. All right, Dennis, we'll talk to you later, and uh, I'll let you say your goodbyes, Jeff, and then we'll let him get back to resting and get back to the show. Yeah, well, uh, good uh, good night, Dennis, and uh, tell Marsha good night, and I'll Yeah, she talking. can hear you. I got, I got you on speaker. Okay. All right, and then uh, I sh- I'll talk to you guys tomorrow, and uh, I'm still okay. working on the uh, bait house and see if uh, you guys can stay there uh, while you're still in Tennessee. So. All right. Yeah, just so you know, we're in room 489. 489, okay. I'll write that down. Yep. Okay. All right. Have a good show. Okay. All right. Thank you. Probably be listening. Okay. Be well, then, you and Marsha. All right. See you. What a great guy. I tell you what, he has uh, he has supported us all the way since we've ever started this show. When the uh, shirts first came out, he was one of the first people to get a shirt, and uh, that's where I got his picture from was uh, the shirt and everything. And another side note real quick, and then we'll get into everything that we've got lined up here tonight. Our youngest grandson, Reese, as most of you know, he has CF, and he has to go to Vanderbilt for regular checkups. And about once a year, he has to go into the hospital because his checkups don't pan out exactly right, and that's what happened today. And he will be entering Vanderbilt for another 14-day uh, round of antibiotics and treatment, so keep him in your prayers as well. As far as that goes, I guess the rest of us are well, ain't we, Jeff? Well, yeah, I mean, I look at my little ailments, well, you know, it can always be worse. Yeah, sure yeah. It's your ten, and we've got a great show lined up tonight, and uh, we're going to have a surprise giveaway somewhere in this show. So uh, pay attention, stay with us. You got to be here. You got to be on uh, on the show. You got to be on the on the chat here tonight uh, to win whatever we're going to give away, and we'll get to that probably at the top of the hour. But we've got a great guest lined up tonight, don't we, Jeff? We sure do. We have Charles Deschler on uh, uh, as a guest tonight, and I mean, I've seen some of his bow work, and I mean, it's some great work. So, how you doing, Charles? I'm doing pretty good. How are you, Jeff? Just fine, just fine. Yeah, so. yeah good to have you on the show. We've been uh, we've been excited about this because uh, you're an interesting guy. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Uh, not only are you a treasure hunter, a metal detectorist, but you also make bows. And there's some other things that we're going to bring out about your life tonight. And uh, before we're through, everybody's going to know something about Charles that they didn't know before. But uh, the way we start our first segment off most of the time is just give us a little bit of background and tell us how you got started into metal detecting. And by the way, you live in Michigan. That's right. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay. Um, 
I was, uh, I've been all over the place really, but since about four years old, we lived in Michigan and that's uh, where I grew up and, um, uh, it's pretty well been home for the last, uh, 45, 46 years, I guess. But, um, yeah, so, uh, I think your question was how to get started in detecting. Yeah. Yes, that's right. And, yeah. So, uh, like a lot of guys, I guess, you know, I just always had a kind of an interest in it. And, um, where I grew up in a small town in mid Michigan here, you know, we we're we don't have any beaches around, uh, you know, no big, no big lakes, no oceans, no nothing like that. But, um, I just, like any little kid, you know, you see a guy digging stuff out of the ground uh, on TV or something, and it just kind of sparked your interest. And I always liked pirate movies. I always liked uh, the the Mel Fisher story, of course. Um, that was all going on in my high school years, and I followed it as I could. You know, we didn't have internet and all that stuff back then. But um, it, you just, you know, you'd, you'd see a... Uh, a cover on a magazine or something at the store and it just, you know, it lit my eyes up. I'll tell you what. Um, so, uh, I never, I never really got to do any, uh, treasure hunting, I guess. Um, other than surface finds my, I'm, I'm pretty well known for finding stuff on the surface. Uh, I drive down the road and I see something laying there. I'll turn around, go back, pick it up, you know, shovel, a rake, a bungee cord, whatever. Um, I found money, uh, believe it or not, I'm driving down the road in town or something. I see a dollar bill or something blowing across the road and I stop and get it. But so I, you know, that was, that was the extent of my treasure hunting until the, the early to mid nineties. Um, when I was actually nursing a bad back, um, and I'd fallen asleep in the chair and, it, uh, I woke up and there's a, a mine lab commercial on, on the cable TV channel, you know, and boy, that really hit me pretty hard. And I don't know, probably within the next year or two, I had a, I had a mine lab metal detector actually that I, I bought. Um, it was a gold machine. I didn't even know it was a pulse induction machine until a couple of years ago. <laughs> because, oh, wow. you know, I just didn't know about, I didn't know about all that stuff. It was a mine lab XT 17,000. And, um, it was a dedicated gold machine and, you know, it just drove me crazy. I'd get out here in the, in the Michigan soil and, you know, I'd go dig some junk, you know, several times a year. And I think, um, I honestly think I'm telling you the truth that the only penny or the only money I ever found with that thing was a 1974 penny. Uh, 74. So. I, mean, I could imagine you're using the pulse machine around old home sites and just trash it. I, I, mean, I bet that was hard. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing, Jeff. Um, I I remember the guy that sold it to me. He was, he was a neat character. He was a, a miner. Um, he'd run a gold dredge and a sluice, and uh, he'd go to Arizona every winter. And um, he was good people. Um, him and his wife were, were real good people to us. And, uh, he ended up with this detector in on a trade deal, I guess. And he made me a good deal on it. And, uh, you know, I used it. I, I found a lot of stuff for people. I was, I did more um, finding, you know, I found the, the property stakes and, you know, buddy loses a, an expensive arrow for his, you know, target practicing. And, uh, uh, one kid took uh, the keys out of the camp trailer and lost them. And, you know, I found all that stuff. I was I was pretty good at finding things for people, and um, that that was that's what I did with that machine. <laughs> it was, I didn't find no no treasure with it. That was for sure. <laughs> so, how did it feel uh, when you got a machine that had discrimination on it? Um, yeah. So that was. Um, I had that, that mine lab, I think I bought that in 96 or seven and, you know, I just, I just monkeyed around with it all those years. And, um, and then I got, when I got onto um, Facebook and I started seeing some groups and things of, uh, I, I don't know if I searched it out one day or whatever, but, um, as soon as I 
found out about metal detecting and how popular it was, I guess. Uh, it, basically, I seen one picture online, and that was it. I was getting a new machine. <laughs> so um, I ended up getting a, a Fisher F44, and uh, I like that little machine. I found I found some good stuff with that. Uh, I struggled with it, trying to figure it out. But once I, you know, I asked a few questions to some guys, and they helped me out, and I got some good settings on it. And boy, uh, I went to uh, I went to a, a pretty good sized recreational lake um, about an hour and a half from here with one of my my hunting buddies. Um, I, did, I never met the guy before. I met him that day, uh, but we had chatted online. He's actually got family lives in my hometown, um, but, but he invited me down there, and I went down and hunted with him and. He said, how's your machine work? I said, well, I don't know, you know, I was <laughs> struggling, but I went, I dug like two signals and I dug a 14 karat gold uh, child's ring. Oh, man. So he, he sat there looking at me, scratching his head like, why'd you dig it? And I'm like, yeah, it was a good signal, you know, it just, it, I remember it rang up 44 and uh, just beat nice and clean and it sounded a lot different than all that other junk I'd been digging, so... <laughs> It worked out pretty good that time. You know, I, I think I was a blind squirrel, but I'll take it. Well, it happens to all of us. Hey, guys, we need to take a commercial break, and we'll be right back. You know, T-shirts are a perfect way to get your brand recognized, whether you're talking about a business, a club, a sports team, your YouTube channel, or whatever. But you may have asked, where can I get quality, affordable shirts on demand? Well, I'm glad you asked. Relics Radio uses DetectTees.com for all of our T-shirts, long sleeve shirts, and hoodies. That's D-E-T-E-C-T-E-E-S.com. Ken and Mark Guthrie make quality shirts that last, they ship quick, and best of all, they're affordable. So if you need customized apparel, then go to DetectTees.com. And be sure and tell them that Relics Radio sent you. And Charles, courtesy of DetectTees.com and Ken and Mark Guthrie, we're going to give you a shirt at the conclusion of the show tonight. You just send me your information, right. and uh, they are great shirts. Uh, they got uh, two rednecks with a metal detector on the back of them. <laughs> That's our motto. <laughs> and so uh, yeah. you, you may get some yeah, strange looks, it. but uh, you know they, <laughs> they they have a little bit of uh, they have a little bit of luck with them, don't they, Jeff? They sure do. I've I've had quite a bit of luck with mine on. So, and hopefully uh, you'll have uh, some success on, with your zone. So, what a uh, what kind of detector do you use now? Well, after. Um, I was I was hunting actually on my birthday um, the that first year with my Fisher and I I had some problems with it. I swamped it out as in rain and everything and so I had to send that back and then I got into a um, an AT Pro. Um, I took that out of the truck, walked into my front yard that I had worked over pretty hard with the Fisher and the Mine Lab and uh, found a, my first Mercury dime, so that was pretty exciting. Um, ended up my buddy bought the AT pro from me and then I got, um, I got into a dais and I sold the, uh, I sold the Fisher to my neighbor and then I bought a, I, I got a really hot deal on a dais. So I got into that and, um, and then last year, uh, well, a couple, a couple years ago, I guess I, I started just was, um, interested for some reason in, in old school. I like old school things, as you know. And, uh, so I got it to Soro and then I got, um, that one had a couple problems with it, but, uh, no, I, I got it to Soro Tejan as well. And I like that. That's, that's a fun machine. You know, it's, it's, I, I got each end of the spectrum, I guess, from the dais to the Tesoro. Um, that's the only machines I got, but, um, I like them both. I like them yeah. both a lot. They say the Desoro Desto- is a great machine. Now I've seen a, I hunted with a guy. Uh, it's been a couple of years ago, and of course he, I mean, he done very well at a, a Civil War fort that we hunted, and I mean, of course he was digging like a madman, but he he done good. So, 
Yeah, my my buddy Kevin there that I found the ring with at that time. Him and I we we get together you know a time or two each year and and um, we swing. But uh, New Year's Day we I went down to his place and he had a, uh, a couple old home sites in the in the field zone and, and we were actually warm here. Um, you know, we could dig on January first. Um, my I had sent my uh, headphones in, my wireless headphones in for the dais because uh, uh, to get some repair work done. But I was going to try and um, use a set of earbuds with it, and then I ended up leaving it home by mistake. Anyways, I, but you know, I walked out of the house early in the morning, left my detector laying there, but I had the the Tesoro with me. So I said, I, I was only a couple miles from home, and I said, I'm just going to use it to sorrow, you know. So. He, he had a, uh, he's got an E-track that he's pretty handy with. And, um, I dug 26 pounds of iron that day and he dug about one pound, maybe, <laughs> but he got two, he got two, uh, Indian head pennies. Um, but in that, uh, in that 26 pounds, I had some, I had my first crotal bell. I had my first ox shoe. Um, I had a reins guide. I had a part of an old axe head and, you know, some, I like square nails, you know, of course there are nemesis, but, um, when, when I can pull a good one out of the ground, you know, it, 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 it a big one, this, this was pretty big and it wasn't, wasn't terribly rusted. Um, I got that, but yeah, I, could, I went back to truck about three times and emptied my pouch and, <laughs> I got I said, a bucket. Well, there's a coin here, I'm gonna get it. Yeah, I got a bucket that I keep out in the field now and uh, and fill it up with iron and everything. But also, yeah. you are a bow maker. Why don't you get into that and tell us a little bit about that? How you got started in that, and when, and what have you? Yeah. So um, my my mom on my mom's side of the family, we got some Native American blood. And, uh, my mom's actually an elder in the tribe, um, today. And, but she, she always told me, she says, when you found that out, you kind of went crazy and, you know, you wanted a bow. So we got you a bow and that was about six or seven years old. And, um, I just, I, since that day, I can remember shooting that first arrow and, uh, just loved watching them fly. Uh, so I, I came up all the way through, uh, you know, school and stuff, shooting that bow. And I, I bought another one at a yard sale that I monkeyed around with, but, um, uh, I went into the Navy. I graduated in 85. I went into the Navy, um, that at that time. And, um, I didn't shoot any bow then of course, but, uh, we, I got out in 1990 and I went to a yard sale and, um, at my, is at my parents' neighbor's house is actually my, uh, my cousin, my dad's cousin rather lived there and, um, they were having a yard sale and they had a, a compound bow for sale. And I thought, man, I'm going to go bow on it. So I bought that bow and I shot that for a little while, but, um, the job I got when I got out of the service was drilling water wells. And, um, so I was on a job site and we were drilling next to an old barn and, uh, there was a big woodchuck hole there. And I told the homeowner, he was out talking to us. And I, he said, man, I got to get that woodchuck out of there. It's going to break my barn down. And I said, well, go get you a 22 or something. And I said, I'll stick my big water holes down there and we'll flush him out. And he said, I'll be right back. He come out and he had a back quiver on. He had a bunch of arrows sticking in that thing with the, the you know, the turkey feathers on there. And he had a, he had a wooden, longbow and i just about fell off the truck you know i thought what in the world is that and so we talked about it he ends up he he ran a uh a bow shop and i i went home that night i brought my compound bow back to work the next day and i gave it to the guy i worked with because he, he wanted it he really liked my bow so i gave it to him and that weekend i went to the to the to brian was the guy's name i went to his shop and i bought a longbow um and from there, so that was in 1991 when I started um, uh, making bows, actually. And um, there, we, there's big archery events. There's big traditional archery events all over the country. And um, at that time, we had the biggest one. Um, 
here in Michigan with the Michigan Longbow Association. And um, there was a the guys there making wooden bows. You know, they, they had maple and hickory and Osage and ash and locust and that sort of thing. Just, just you know, solid wood bows. And uh, I, that's where I, I started making my bows right then, right there at that event. And uh, I never really, I never really quit. Um, at, you know, we've been, we've, we've been around the block since 1991. I met my wife, uh, at work in 1994. We had, I had some pretty uh, big life-changing events in 94. Uh, my brother got banged up real bad in an accident. And I decided it was pretty well time for me to quit screwing around. And, um, so I, I met my wife and, uh, we did, you know, we did our thing. Um, we ended up moving to Montana and hung out out there for a while. And I didn't, I didn't do a lot of bow making, but we got, we got some pictures of me standing there in our little cabin uh, <laughs> with with a piece of wood clamped to a to a sawhorse or something. I was working on a bow there, but um, the the bows that I make today, I started that in, um, I believe it was two thousand and six. Now, and, what what styles of bows do you make? What sizes and what have you do you make? Yep. Yeah, so uh, right now, I make I make a fiberglass laminated bow, um, and I make them from fifty four, fifty six, and fifty eight inches um, in the one style, and the fifty six is by far my most popular um, size there. Um, then I've got two other styles that. Um, I can make up to seventy inches long. Now, are those long inches? Are those long bows, or what we used to call recurve, or is there a difference? I don't know the difference. Yeah, yeah. So there is a difference. Um, I make only long bows. Uh, the the two longer models um, would be what I would call long bow proper, I guess. Uh, one is a Howard Hill style American long bow. Um, the other one's a, just a deflex reflex long bow, but my, my most popular one, the 56 inch Ogama is, um, uh, is what's called a hybrid long bow. I call it a hybrid flat bow cause it's, you know, the design that I've made there, um, it's, it's short, it's maneuverable. It, it works really good, you know, in tight spaces, whether you're hunting in a tree stand or a ground blind or, you know, stalking through the woods or something like that. Um, and it, it's just real easy to shoot. You know, it, it, the design lends itself to accurate shooting. Yeah. And what kind of wood do you normally make the uh, bows out of? Well, my favorite wood is Osage orange, um, hedge or hedge apple, bow dart. Um, you know, a lot of, it, that grows a lot down south. So, um, like I was telling you before the show, I, I used to get all my, my Osage out of Tennessee, but, um, so that would be for an all wood bow or self bow, but the, um, I use all sorts of exotics and, and domestic fancy woods here in the, in the laminated bows that I make now. Um, you know, curly maple, walnut burl, um, you know, koa from Hawaii, rosewoods from South America and Africa and purple heart and, the Cody and Coca Bolo, you know, just anything and everything. Well, do you do you actually deer hunt with your bows? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, 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 I'd, I'd say I'm a shooter first. You know, I'm an archer because um, I love I just go around the yard, out in the woods, cross the field, whatever, with a with a bow in my hand, just shooting a leaf or a pine cone or a, you know an old tree stump or something. But, um. You know, that's just practice for uh, October 1st here in Michigan when our deer season opens, our bow season. And uh, uh, so, yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been bow hunting uh, pretty much every, every fall since 1990. Wow. We had a question in the chat, Greg uh, Weems. He, he was asking, uh, can you make me a uh, English uh, longbow? I can. I love English longbows. I've made quite a few of them. Um, the, the typically an English longbow, you know, would be, well, it is made out of 
uh, solid wood and, and all the, all those style of bows. I don't, I don't have a, a time to do that so much anymore, but, um, Greg's been, Greg has been bugging me. Him and him and I are buddies on, uh, one of my groups on, okay. on Facebook. So he's, he's bugging me, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I should get going. In fact, I got a local, local guy here that, um, he just texted me this morning, wants to get an English longbow made. So maybe I'll have to make a couple of them. So that didn't take you by surprise, did it? Hey guys, we need to run another commercial and uh, we'll be right back. If your passion is metal detecting, then you know how much your success is based on the equipment you use. Let my buddy Tim Henderson of Murray Branch Outdoors in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, help you with that. Tim is an authorized dealer of Mine Lab, Garrett, XP Deus, and Macro Detectors and Supplies, and also carries many aftermarket items. Murray Branch Outdoors is not only competitive in their prices, but the service after the sale is second to none. Tim not only sells detectors, he uses them, and so he can answer any question that you might have. Murray Branch Outdoors also deals in used detectors, and he'll take your old detector in on trade when you decide to upgrade. So give Tim Henderson of Murray Branch Outdoors a call at 615-948-4611 or visit his website at www.murraybranchoutdoors.com and be sure and tell him Relics Radio sent you. And a reminder, guys... In conjunction with Murray Branch Outdoors and Nocta Micro, we're going to give away an Amphibio metal detector this quarter, sometime between now and June. And uh, we'll be putting up some information on that on the Relics Radio Facebook group page. So you need to be a member of that if you're not, because that's where you're going to enter and get your numbers. I guess that's the way we'll do it uh, again. Uh, go ahead. I think you got some more questions, don't you, Jeff? Yeah, I had one myself. Uh, what do you make the arrows out of? The same wood, the uh, bow dark? No. Um, so arrows uh, typically are made out of, you know, the, the old standby was uh, Port Orford Cedar comes off the uh, Pacific Northwest up in Oregon, Washington State. Um, but any any wood of that, of that type, you know, spruce or uh, Doug fir is a real good arrow, um, all sorts of, you know, all the different spruces, Sitka spruce and, and that, um, some hardwoods, uh, are used as well. Um, mostly to be honest with you, I shoot carbon arrows. Um, what, what kind of really got me started, um, I wanted to make arrows. So I, I ended up uh, coming across a bunch of wood arrow shafts and all that. And I, I made a lot of arrows um, for a few years, and uh, I don't know, you know, just my nature, I guess. Uh, I went from arrows to bows pretty quick and um, been cruising ever since, you know, pretty pretty much full-time. I was a carpenter for, uh, I don't know, a long time on and off, um, framing and uh, all sorts of remodeling and that sort of thing, and then building custom homes with my dad and my high school buddy. Um, uh, but making bows all through that. And then in, you know, 08, 09, when the, everything crashed, you know, our housing market here in Michigan just dumped. And luckily I had this goal and I was selling bows at the time and I just went full time at it. And was, you know, real thankful that I was, you know, already positioned to be able to do that. Yeah. We, we also had another question for Woody Jones and, does your long bows that you make do they vary in draw weight yep so you know everything's custom with me um so if you're ordering a bow i'm gonna we're gonna talk about it and and recommend the one that shoots uh shoots what or fits your desire you know whether it's target or hunting or you know whatever whatever you want. And then we fit it right to you, whether you're right hand, left hand, um, high risk, low risk, you know, depending on your grip. And, and then we're going to figure out your draw weight or your draw length rather, and, and put your draw weight right exactly at your draw length. 
So, you know, it's it's a total custom fit. It's it, it's like a tailored suit almost. Yeah, it's a piece of art. I mean, that's pretty much the way it is. And we also had, yeah. a, how long does it take you to make a single bow? And then, uh, um, that's a, that's a open-ended question. Um, it really depends on how, uh, how fancy it is, I guess, you know, how many different pieces I put in there. Um, you know, but the, the rough guessment would be, you know, somewhere between 15 and 20 hours for the most part, um, mm-hmm. you know, some of the, some of the higher, uh, the more complicated bowls, I guess, that I put together, you know, might be more than that, 25 hours or something like that. Yeah. And then you can find uh, your bows at, uh, what is it, Two Track Bow Company? Yep. On, on Facebook, my, my website is actually twotracksoutdoors.com, um, but I can't seem to get Facebook to let me change my um my name on my on my two tracks page on on the Facebook, so it's two tracks bow company, two tracks bow co on there. And I've got that uh, listed in the description on this show here, so uh, you can go there, and then uh, somebody could put it in the chat. The uh, actual website that is two tracks outdoors is that correct? Dot com. Yes, sir. Okay. And then uh, they can get around to that. And uh, Mark Hoover had asked a question earlier. Do you ever go out into the woods or anything and take a bow and a metal detector? (laughs) Uh, No, I can't say that I've done that. Um, Well, I guess every fall, um, my... I told you that Fisher F-44 slumped out on me. That was on October 2nd. So it was second day of bow camp, but it was raining. So we didn't go bow hunting, but we went metal detecting. Um, so I don't take them at the same time, but I, I've been known to take a metal detector to bow camp, yes. <laughs> Me and Jeff couldn't do that because we get out there in the woods, and if we didn't find anything, we'd get mad. We just want to shoot something, wouldn't we, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, there wouldn't be a live cow from here in Texas if we, if we had a bow with it. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it you know, the funny thing was that day, October 2nd is my birthday as well. So um, I was in the north woods of Michigan out in the middle of a cedar swamp. And my buddy has got a beautiful cabin out there. And he's just, uh, his his name's, we, his uh, bow name is the tree dancer, but his metal detecting handle is uh, Big Nectar. But uh, so <laughs> we're, we're out uh, in the woods metal detecting and we had an old uh, home site in the woods that we knew or that he knew about. That's his neck of the woods. But um, so we're we're detecting all of a sudden the, the CO shows up and we we knew we were doing good. You know, we were in good shape. But, you know, here all of a sudden here comes the CO surprising us pulling up over the hill, you know, and he gets out and he would just he was all intrigued. He had seen um you know, KJ and Ringy on TV and he's, Oh yeah, I just want to know all about this. You guys finding anything? And so he, we, we chatted with him for probably half an hour. And of course he asked us, so, you know, we, we don't bow hunt. We're like, Oh yeah, we're big bow hunters. And he says, but your metal detecting said, well, it's raining, you know? <laughs> so we, he thought it was funny that we, uh, we could metal detect, but not bow hunt. And then he, he asked, he says, where'd your, where'd your camp at? And we told him, he goes, you got that's like the best deer hunting in the county right there, <laughs> and you guys are going. So we were we were a little bit shamefaced right then, but uh, uh, we got over it. You know, we went we went down to a beach after that and found some found some more junk and coins, and I think something my my buddy's grandson I think found a, a little junker ring. But oh yeah, it was good good fun. You guys know what it's about. Oh yeah, it's it's great fun. Uh, how did you come yeah. up with the name Two Tracks? Mark Hoover wanted to know that. Yeah. Um, so my my wife and I, um, we were bouncing different names around, and, and we had one name for years that we were always going to call a, a, a bow business when we finally, you know, when I finally was going to start making bows uh, for sale and everything. But uh, um, that, that didn't pan out for us, so we were – 
tossing other things around and uh, I don't know one of us you know said something about two tracks in, in Michigan we call it two tracking um, you know you go out in the woods you know with your with your four by four and you go down the two track lane right so uh -huh. that's what I grew up always knowing what a two track was but um, as soon as we said two tracks we knew that was going to be the name and uh, we I was a bow maker and doing all of that stuff. And then my wife, um, we, we got a small farm here and we raised uh, sheep and we shear the sheep. And then she was, she'd felt the wool and we'd make, um, we started making a uh, felted wool vest and then insoles and then hats and, uh, you know, string silencers for the bows and just different things, different artwork and stuff like that. So, it kind of had a dual meaning for us, you know, it was just two tracks out in the woods and uh, two tracks for the, the two different sides of the business kind of. And um, it just, this was a nice name and, you know, catchy, I guess. And so we ran with it. And the way I understand it, you guys kind of went off the grid for a while, didn't you? Yep. So uh, I told you my, in 94, when my, my brother got in that bad accident, broke his back and his knee and his collarbone and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, that really, um, that really kind of messed with my head a little bit. And I just wanted to, I needed to get out of here after he got, um, recuperated, you know, and came home and stuff. Um, but I, I just had enough of, you know, big city life and we live in the country. It's not like we live downtown, you know, we're, we're country, country folk, but, um, we, my wife and I went on vacation one February, uh, to Montana and we took our tent. We were winter camping out there and we found a piece of land and we bought it. And, uh, that was in 94. And I think, I don't know what it was, 95 or 96. We, uh, we moved out there and we built a little cabin and, um, we, we, I was a big game guide. I worked as, I was, uh, worked for an outfitter and, you know, I was a guy in elk hunters and bear hunters, cat hunters and all sorts of, you know, white tailed deer mostly is, um, is what we did. Uh, but my wife worked in the lodge as a, you know, as a, as a lodge hand there. And, um, we packed horses and we catered people around and we set up camps and we did all sorts of stuff like that. But, um, from 96 to 2001, I guess we, um, we lived off grid. I mean, we had no electricity, no, no plumbing, no, uh, nothing. Uh, wow. we, we, yeah, we, um, it, this wasn't on our property. Uh, it was a, it was a different property that we ended up, um, being able to caretake, I guess you could say, but they had, we say that that place did have running water, um, because there was a gold mine, um, about 75 yards from the cabin and it had, uh, water running out of that. And then a rock dam made a pool and we could, we could go out there and get our buckets and dip them in there and, and, uh, bring them back to the cabin. So, you know, we had running water. It was just 75 yards from the house. See, well, I learned something here. I didn't know you call that off the grid. That's the way we lived whenever I was a kid. No electricity, <laughs> no indoor bathroom, no running water. We did drive a faucet out in the yard to make all the neighbors think that we did have it, though. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, we all know your story, though. I mean, you, they, they didn't have none of that stuff when you was growing up. No. Nobody. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, he ate, uh, ate cat food, tuna sandwiches. So <laughs> everybody, was, everybody was off the grid then. What's, that, what's yeah. that experience like, and what's it like to transition then back into modern society from that? Well, when you, you know, I was in, um, I guess my thirties at the time and, uh, uh, late twenties, I started, came home in the, in my early to mid thirties. And, um, you know, when you, when you grow up in the Midwest, you know, it, it's go, go, go. You gotta, you gotta get up and go to work and, and you move fast and you don't dilly dally and, and that sort of thing. Well, when, 
when it takes you, you know, an hour to take a shower every night because you got to heat water up on the either the, the propane stove or a, uh, the wood stove, you know, that, that'll slow you down. And when you, when you want to cook something, you know, you got to, uh, of course we were, we were in high cotton there when we got the propane hooked up, you know, and, but when I say propane, I'm talking about a Coleman stove and, and that sort of thing. Um, but you got to go get water. You got to, you got to go, you know, cutting firewood all the time. I mean, you know, it's, you slow down, you don't, you can't go, go, go. You got to, you got to keep moving, but you got to, you got to work your butt off to, um, to get through the day, you know? And so when you're, when you got to go out and work your job and then come home and do all of that, so it's, it's a rough life. I mean, it's, it, there's, there's no time for, for being lazy. I guess you could say, you know, you gotta, you gotta keep moving, keep your chores done. Yep. And yep. then of course we've got to go to a commercial break, but, uh, of course, everybody in the chat here, I'm, I'm sure just about everybody, and I know I have, uh, my wife's talked about it, uh, going off grid. And after the commercial break, uh, do you have any recommendations or uh, any uh, any insight on uh, living off the grid? Anything we could learn from you? Yeah, um, while you're thinking about that, then we'll go to this commercial break. <laughs> If you want to keep up with what's going on in the metal detecting world, then you need to be a subscriber to American Digger magazine. Butch and Anita Holcomb are the publishers of the magazine and have won awards for three straight years for being the best digger magazine on the market. American Digger magazine is available in both print and digital formats. So no matter where you live in the world, you can enjoy the latest happenings in the hobby. You can get in touch with American Digger Magazine by going to americandigger.com or give them a call at 770-362-8671. And be sure and tell them that you heard it on Relics Radio. And by the way, guys, I am the producer of American Digger Relic Roundup every Monday night with Butch Holcomb, the legend, and Jeff Lupert, and it's on Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Go ahead, Charles, and uh, address the question there that Jeff had. Good question. Yeah, you know, uh, that was that was a long time ago, obviously, so things may be a little different. But for me, if I was going to go back um, – I would, I would first of all try to secure, you know, to secure work and income. Of course, there are a lot of people I think live off grid that um, still have what I what I would call regular jobs. Um, you know, where they they may drive to the office or they they drive to the job site or something like that. So, um, you know, the the income thing was probably the the biggest hurdle for us to get around. We lived, um, 40, 40 miles, uh, 37 miles one way and, and, um, 41 miles, I think the other way to town. And, you know, so, uh, just a couple hundred people in our, in our County or in that Valley where we live. So, you know, work was scarce, money was scarce. Um, so it, it would be to, you know, secure, make sure your income is secure, your money situation secure, and then um, just keep it simple. You know, I don't, I don't want a bunch of clutter around, you know, you got, you, you need to be able to eat and drink and, and relax and, you know, go out to your shop and make bowls, I guess. That sounds good. <laughs> and I, mean, I would have to have the ability to have my studio, I could not go off the grid anymore. There's no way. <laughs> yeah. I would have to. I'd have to have the ability to flip the switch and go on the air for a while. If I can do that, I'm well, fine. I'm, you know, I don't care about the running water. And and uh, Woody made a good comment a while ago talking about no indoor bathrooms. And I tell you guys, I think the worst mistake that mankind ever made was moving the dogs outside and the bathroom inside. But Woody said that. Uh, uh, talking about the outdoor bathroom, he said, 30-yard dash by, will he make it? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, 
I'll, I'll put a new spin on that for you. So we lived in the northwest corner of Montana. We could hike into British Columbia or Idaho. Um, that's grizz country, and that's wolf country, and that's cougar country. And we seen them. We seen bears. We seen grizzly, mountain lion. We've seen it all. Um, our neighbors across the way, uh, they were going to bed one night. And the, my buddy's wife, um, is actually my pastor, our pastor at the time and his wife, she went out, uh, to go to the, to go to the outhouse before bed, you know, and, uh, their four-year-old daughter and three or four-year-old, she was real tiny. She was standing on the back porch, holding the flashlight in, in the doorway, holding the flashlight, uh, so mama could walk out side and and go use the bathroom and uh they heard a big wolf and a growl and and the daughter moved the light and there was the biggest grizzly in the valley everybody knew this grizz it was it was almost 900 pounds you know had been tagged and and handled and everything by the fish and game but uh, that grizz was i think it was about 11 feet from uh, from mama oh <laughs> mama Mama wet her pants and, and ran back to the house and uh, heard her knee coming through the coming through the door and picked the kid up and threw the kid into dad's arms and yeah uh, scared people <laughs> so um, and told daddy we're yeah. leaving the grid <laughs> yeah. well they uh, yeah. they had had a and I don't I can't remember now if this was I think it was beforehand um, that that grizz had been in um, and killed their goats. They had, a, they had a couple of milk goats that they were using. They were off grid as well, um, but they had the milk goats and that grizz got in and killed one. And uh, it was chasing the other one around the, around and around the cabin. And the goat would jump up on the porch and, you know, gallop across the porch running for his life. And the grizz would bang into things and rock the whole cabin. And uh, yeah, it was, it, it was interesting. So, um, yeah, uh, late night bathroom runs are, <laughs> are are pretty uh, pretty interesting. That's how you better have your sidearm with you when you go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Always, yeah. I carried I carried a big pistol at least every every time I was out. Yeah, yeah. We had a uh, I, they called it a chamber or something. I can't remember now what it was. It just big old pot that you had in the house, yep. you know, so that you didn't, especially in the winter time, you know. And you were talking about baths and everything. I know whenever I was young, all the girls got to, uh, and we had a big wash tub in the kitchen, and they would heat water and put in there. All the women got to take a bath first, and then the men last. And by the time we got in there, the water was always cold, and it was already dirty by the time that we got in there. Yeah. Hey, guys, we're past our uh, syndication point now, so we're going to open up the phone lines, and uh, Jeff can put it in chat for me if he will. The number is 270-495-0315. And uh, if you've got a question for Charles, you can call in and ask him that. I'd like to transition over to uh, just a subject of treasure hunting. And I know in your case, the answer to or your explanation of treasure hunting is going to be different than a lot of people's. Can you explain what treasure hunting is to Charles and, and his family? Yeah, well, um, treasure hunting to me, you know, it is what it is. Uh, I, I get excited about just about anything, you know, that um, that day my buddy Kevin and I were detecting here a few months ago um 26 pounds of iron you know and i was i was as tickled with uh with an ox shoe and a a bent croto bell and a you know a couple other knickknacks as i was anything else and um i mean you know don't get me wrong i want some big silver and some gold and you know all that sort of thing too but um we i just to for me to go out on a field where there used to be a house and just pull some stuff out and, and look at it and feel it and throw it in a bucket. You know, I don't know. I just like it. Uh, it is what it is. Of course, um, I'm, I'm probably the worst researcher out there, uh, but I'm getting more into finding the old, um, 
the old home sites and, and little ghost towns and stuff around here. And um, so hopefully this year uh, I'm going to be able to get on some of them uh, before the crops go in the field. Our farmers are pretty, pretty efficient around here. And last year I had a couple sites picked out and, but, you know, the way the weather works and everything, it was by the time I had an opportunity, they had crops in the field. And so it was done. But, uh, so that's, that's what it is. Um, uh, it just, it kind of depends on the area, you know, um, when we're around here, I like to, uh, go to a park and I, I try to find an old area of the park. I, some of the parks I go to are, they are, they do have some age and I found silver and stuff there, but I try to find the old areas, you know, I'm still looking for the little honey hole that somebody missed or, um, go to the go to the ball field where everybody lays out during the fireworks on 4th of July and see if anybody drops some fresh coin or a ring or something uh, uh, you know I go up north and, and to my buddy's camp and we go out in the woods looking for old logging camps and and uh, all that kind of thing there's a lot of history up there um, a lot of automotive uh, you know they used to make steering wheels and you know, wood spoke car tires or car rims up there, just all sorts of stuff like that, you know? So we, we find those things and, you know, we don't know what some of it is, but it's pretty cool. And, and, uh, you got it. So there it is. And we've got a caller. We've got a caller on 4852 are the last four numbers. Who have we got? And what's your question for Charles? Hey, this is one of his best friends, Greg Wayne. Okay, Greg. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah how you doing greg you know, man doing good see we never like talk you know voice to voice you know the wonders of the uh smartphone the internet all that good stuff we're always messaging yeah. each other all during the day yeah, yeah i'm talking to you live man <laughs> yeah there it is huh? yeah so, 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 when, so I will bring up, yeah what's your question greg go ahead i'm sorry when, when are you when are you going to buy some uh property down here in mississippi well, I tell you what, about another seven or eight months of winter, and I'll, I'm ready for it. But I don't know. You were telling me about them darn crawly things down there. Oh, I don't well, know all I'm, the venomous snakes that we have. Oh, and and there are and, <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I heard Jeff, Jeff said the other day he's already had ticks on him. Oh, and yeah, I, yeah. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. you know. It, yep. it'd be interesting to put me and Jeff in the woods together. Cause I can, I pull every tick around, and get on me. Well, Hey, Maybe that'll work with me. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Spring time. Spring time down here. I'm going to let you win. Yeah. So yeah, do you have I'm a gonna, question? Uh, um, tell us about, uh, you know, how good, you know, where everybody's like, uh, dumping on the tesoros lately and uh you know we're yeah. trying to convince these people that just because the factory's having issues it doesn't mean that it's like the uh we're, we're attacks to the factory that the machines are you know are going down that uh you know what uh your experiences with your uh Tejan, since me and you were Tejan brothers right yeah so um and i was going to say that's where greg and i um kind of come into contact with each other was running the Tesoro detectors. And, um, uh, I ended up making a, a group for Tesoro hunters. And last year there was a whopping nine or 10 people in that group, but boy, did we have some fun, didn't we, Greg? We were, yeah, we were we going to laugh. We were going live on the turn. Yeah. Um, yeah, our yeah buddy we will. Thor Hill. Pick it back up. Yeah. Our, our yeah, buddy we, Thor Hill from the chat, or at least he was, he's from Scotland. Yeah. we got a, he left. Another buddy from Bosnia. Um, yep. We got uh, quite a few guys from down there, and Greg's from uh, Biloxi area. Uh, we got quite a few guys from down in that neck of the woods. And uh, John, I don't know time. what are we up to, Greg? We're up to twenty-seven, twenty-eight people now, or something like that. I think. Yeah, and, and it's but not it's a real thing. quality. It's a quality. But, but we're all dedicated, uh, uh, you know, to sorrel swingers. We all really enjoy the to sorrel and and. Um, and we just have fun, and we we bust a mountain, go go dig some holes, and enjoy it. Yep. 
Yeah, makes it enjoyable. Hey, Greg, Greg, was you was you was you able to stay away from the tornadoes today? Oh, um, it had just blown through. Uh, most of it had pushed off the coast before it came through here. We got a little blustery. Um, it was, you know, this is our typical weather this time of year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, not to downgrade it, we already had, uh, last week had a couple of tornadoes go through Vicksburg and cause some problems, but this is, this is our, uh, our weather pattern. Now, in June, now we're going to have to watch out for hurricanes coming through. This is, uh, this was, this is Katrina land. Yeah. So. Well, great call, Greg, and uh, appreciate you calling in, talking to your buddy no here. No problem. Okay. I know. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Good talking to you, Greg. Yeah. All right. Okay, see you. And also, I told everybody that uh, we were going to have a surprise contest, and we were going to do that at the top of the hour. We're at the top of the hour right now. Mark Hoover, are yep. you awake? You better be because people are fixing to put the answer to this trivia question in the chat. And the first one that gets it right, what we want to know is what is the length in inches of the most popular bow that Charles makes? So put your answers in there. And uh, here's what you're going to get. You're going to get a silver metal detector pendant. Uh, from Cohen Rings by Justin Sully. And uh, whoever gets it right here in a minute, we'll probably get Justin on the phone and uh, let you talk to him. Uh, Greg got it. It's already, yeah. Okay, we've already got one in. Who got it? Greg. Craig did? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Craig. Uh, you call in then at uh, 270-495-0315. And while you're doing that, I'm going to link up uh, Mr. Sully, and uh, we will hook you two guys up. You can tell him what kind of detector that you've got, and uh, he'll get it out to you. While we're waiting on Craig, yeah. while we're waiting on Craig yeah. to call in, uh, I'm trying to add Justin in, calling him. And uh, boy, that went quick, didn't it? Hello. Hey. Yeah. First guess, I think. First guess. Somebody was listening, wasn't they? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Good we're job. we're we're still waiting on Craig to uh, to call us here. Uh, We'll give him a few minutes to uh, to do that. He may be like uh, he may be like Ring Finder. He may be looking for his can and string. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, uh, Justin reached out to us last night and just told us that he wanted to uh, wanted to give away this uh, prize here tonight. And uh, uh, what a gesture! And I tell you what, those yeah. things are they are beautiful. I, I think um, there's there's several uh, guys in the community, you know, the, between a uh, couple T-shirt outfits and, uh, you know, the, the silversmiths and the jewelry maker types and, and those coin rings. I mean, uh, and then I think there's quite a quite a few people dabble in uh, taking the, the fines and, and making little art pieces out of the even the, the trash pieces, don't they? Um, yeah, I, did, I see that stuff pop up in the in the groups from time to time, and pretty pretty cool how people get into the hobby, you know, in such a way to um, kind of the way I got into bow making. You know, I just like shooting bows. Next thing I know, you know, I'm doing it full time, building a shop. And, yeah, and we do have money. we do have a call that has come in zero five three seven. Is this you, Craig? Yes, sir. It is. Well, congratulations. congratulations. Uh, I will let uh, I will you. I will let you and and uh, Justin have the floor here for just a minute, and you can tell him what kind of detector that you've got, and uh, he will make that. And then I guess you'll have to get on Relics Radio Facebook group page and send us your address and all of that, and we'll. We'll send it over to Justin, or you can message him on Facebook, but uh, however you want to do it, Justin. 
Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Either way, um, I'm on their coin rings by Sully, or just look up Justin Sully. Um, I mean, I'm already on your page. Uh, yeah, see how that is. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, congrats. You know, they're they're fun to make. Uh, just let me know whatever coil you would like, and I'll go ahead and get that made and ship it out to you. And all the coils I make are silver, so I'm not fooling anybody around. What are you swinging, um, Craig? Well, uh, I'm blown away. I'm blown away with your work. To be honest with you. Uh, I swing a Equinox 800. You swing a That's what? That's my favorite one to make, too. An Equinox 800. Oh, an Equinox 800. That's a popular detector right yeah, now, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, I love it. Yeah. I moved up from a AT Pro to that Equinox. Uh, I talked to Heath Jones about it, and it's been rolling ever since. Yeah. Now, where do you live, Craig? Well, what part of the country? I live in Foley, Alabama. Okay. So I, what's What's the best thing the you found? And, with, sir, what's the best thing you found with the Equinox so far? Uh, honestly, my two favorites so far is one of them is a nineteen twenty half dollar, and I found it about six blocks from my house. Wow. And a 1902 Indian head. Those were both my first finds, one for the half dollar and one for the Indian. That's great. two good finds with the 800, that's for sure. Hey, Craig, do us a favor. When uh, you and yes, Justin sir. get hooked up and he gets that sent to you, be sure that you uh, make a picture of yourself with that pendant where that we can see it. And, uh, you know, maybe you're holding it out there or something. So we can put that on the Facebook page and, and give Justin credit for that, for this wonderful giveaway here tonight. Really took us by surprise. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Like I said, I was blown away when I seen his work. I'm, I follow him on his pages and everything. I've, I, I've been blown away by seeing what he does. Well, we didn't give too much information out. You were listening to the show, though, because, man, That's right. you popped that baby in there. <laughs> yeah. Right. Congratulations on that win. And thank you, Sully, for donating that prize. That's pretty killer. Yeah, thank you, Sully. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, guys, uh, we appreciate, uh, Justin, we appreciate the giveaway you offering that. And, uh, guys, go to uh, Cohen Rings by Sully. Check out his work. It is absolutely beautiful. And, uh, Craig, congratulations on winning that. And, uh, like I say, put that picture up there where we can uh, share it with everybody. Everybody will want to see it. Yes, sir. I absolutely will. Thank you all so much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Did either one of you guys have a question for Charles before you hang up? Um, actually, I was going to ask about the bows. Okay, go ahead. On, I know he said he he does mainly long bows. Does he ever do anything with the recurves, like in traditional, like a bone style or bamboo style backings? Um, I the recurve is a is a design where a long bow is kind of a straight limb, and a recurve's got the uh, the big curve at the end. So yes, uh, I have made, I've made both longbow and recurve. Um, I currently do not make a recurve though. Um, with bamboo backing, I've done a lot of that. Uh, bamboo back, Osage and hickory. I've done a lot of hickory back bows as well. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've done, I've done quite a bit. I've done quite a bit with it. Um, from all natural materials to all the all the more modern uh, composite materials that we use, it's definitely an art to see somebody do a traditional bow yeah. by hand. That that's an absolute art. It is. Well, congratulations yeah. on the win and uh, and uh, great question. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing that picture then. So we'll talk to you later, Craig. Yes, sir. Thank okay. you all very much. Okay. See ya. See you later. Thanks. What about you, uh, Justin? Have you got a question that you wanted to ask uh, Charles before you get off? 
Uh, I mean, not really. I, I've been listening to the show. You know, I was driving home from work when it came on. So just listening to it, you know, it, it's very fascinating to see how, you know, different people get into different hobbies and for what reason. And when you can do something and make it, you know, not only functional, but a work of art, that's just tremendous talent. It is. You know, I just hope you hope you keep going and keep popping them out there. You guys yeah, are. Yeah, I appreciate that. You guys are two birds of a feather. Both of you are artists. Yep, we both swing them out of the detector. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Must you be know, a- you get into metal detecting, and then all of a sudden you kind of pick up something else, and then, of course, it it, it kind of all goes in together. But I mean, there is some great artists that I know that are metal detectives. Uh, they do great work on everything they do. Yep. If, well, oh, I got started know, into the ranks. Yeah, and I'll throw that right back at at. Uh, at, at Loy and Jeff, you know, with doing the the show, I remember listening to your first uh, your first podcast, guys. And um, I think I'm trying to remember whose show were you on the week or two before you had your own first show. Uh, but I heard that, and that was the first time I'd I'd heard either of your names. Um, but I could tell right then that you know you you were you were going to come on, and you had kind of a different edge to you about the the art of putting a show together and you guys have really run with it it's been i think a little over a year now and yeah we're uh in november we're coming up on two years and we hit the ground running uh, of course i've got yeah, we did yeah i've got a background in it and so it wasn't mm-hmm. something new to me we talked about doing live stream and uh i told jeff i said i'd i'd rather do a <laughs> podcast because it's kind of a up and coming thing and Besides that, me and Jeff have a face for radio. <laughs> so that's <laughs> yeah. I remember that, you know, with your with your music and that sort of thing. And and I I just I remember I was sitting in this exact same spot I am right now out in my shop that night listening to you. And I said I said that guy he wants to make a he wants to make a radio he wants to make a real good program and, and you're doing a good job at it, man. I love your guys' show. Well, uh, I, I surrounded. Uh, this this show was my idea to start with, but I surrounded myself with uh, good people, and uh, you know they they get the credit for it. Mark does a wonderful job managing us, and uh, he's not beyond calling me on the phone and saying you can't do that, or you need to do more of this, and you need to do less of that. And uh, he gets us phenomenal guests. And always has, uh, yeah. And me and Jeff, you know, we're just uh, two rednecks with a metal detector, ain't we, Jeff? That's right. And I wish we could get out more and uh, metal detect a little bit. Now. We need to start doing that. So, I mean, it, I know how hard it is. Uh, things changes. But, I mean, it's we we need to make it where we can get out metal detecting again. Rick Ward yeah. said I taught, I, that I taught Buddy Holly how to play guitar. That is not true, Rick. But I will tell you this, in all honesty, Buddy Holly taught me the licks on Honky Tonk, that run at the first of Honky Tonk. He lived about a block and a half from me, and uh, they would always set, set up in his bathroom. He lived with his mother at the time, and uh, I learned that uh, I learned that intro lick from Buddy Holly, and what a great loss that it was whenever he passed away. And, and most people don't know that Waylon Jennings was a disc jockey at the radio station then, and uh, Willie Nelson was too for a little while. Now, Waylon lived there, but uh, uh, Willie Nelson was for a while too. So, yeah, Lubbock was a uh, Lubbock was a guitar town. I mean, everybody that was there knew how to play guitar. Or they run you out. <laughs> and, you know, it, it's funny. When we're driving down the road, say if we're – uh, say Charleston or Chattanooga uh, doing a uh, relic show, and it will pass an old bus that's grown up in weeds and everything. Lloyd can say, "Hey, I've been on that bus. Uh, <laughs> uh, hold on, I've been on this bus." And, and it's pretty neat running around with the celebrity that played with Buddy, uh, Buddy Holly. I mean, of course, he was one of my favorite singers. Yeah, yeah, he. Oh, yeah. yeah. He, he was a rhythm guitar player. He he was first person that I think that ever played lead by playing rhythm and uh, it was completely new style and he really influenced the way that i play and uh, if you hear my stuff and and uh, 
songs that I've played on and stuff, you'll see that influence that I had from him. But anyway, we digress. Uh, I, I appreciate the comments there that you made, uh, Charles, on all that. And Justin, we really, really appreciate you uh, volunteering this giveaway here tonight. Yeah, yeah thanks. No problem. And appreciate you uh, you calling in on the show and everything. And uh, guys, if you're looking for a ring or you're looking for a pendant, go to uh, Cohen Rings by Sully and check him out. You can't do any better than that. But we appreciate you being on with us tonight, Justin. Yep, no problem. Thanks, guys. Appreciate okay. having me. Okay. Thank you. Talk to you yep. later then. Charles, and- we got a couple of questions. Uh, uh, what, uh, you've got any memorable mo- uh, memorable moments uh, out shooting in the woods, uh, deer hunting with your uh, own bows that you've made? I know uh, Woody Jones, he was wanting to know uh, what some of your biggest trophies are with your uh, own bows that you've made. Yeah, um, you know, just just regular old hunting tails. Um, you know, the big one that got away, uh, one that comes to mind, I was on the ground um up in a, a big swamp up north of me here about a couple hours i guess and um i heard this ruckus down in the in the swamp and then i heard the grunting so i i started grunting at this buck it was early november and um i somehow i pulled this buck out uh of the swamp and he come up and you know it's it's always the same story. There's uh, one more step or two more steps, and he's clear of the branch, and you could shoot. But I'm on my knees on the ground in front of this uh, bush, and he's on his feet behind the other bush, you know, and he's maybe ten, twelve yards from me, ten, twelve paces. Oh, wow! And um, yeah, and it, I mean, it was the biggest buck I'd ever seen in my life up to that point. Um, it's just a monster. And, you know, we got, we got big deer here in Michigan and this, this deer was one of them and, um, big body, big, big, massive horns. And I can just remember my, um, the deer never looked at me. He walked up and stood and he just looked majestic and he's looking, but he knew something wasn't right, you know, and that's why he's big. But, um, I can remember that, that feeling, you know, right. Just my heart, I swear was going to bust out of my, uh, out of my, uh, um, out of my chest, but the, the absolute worst one was it was October 10th one year. And, um, I went, I was in the woods and I was getting ready to come down. I, I just wanted to stay longer. It's a beautiful morning. And I looked and here comes some deer. And so I was pretty excited. And I seen one was a buck. So I was more excited and they were on the trail. It was going to bring them about 14 yards past my stand. Well, once they came into full view, it was four bucks, and they got bigger as they as they went backwards. Oh man! Um, the the biggest one was the biggest whitetail I've ever seen in Michigan. I've it, I haven't seen two bigger ones, and that was in Montana. Um, this this buck was absolutely enormous, and instead of keeping on the trail and passing me broadside, they turned and came. I had, I had those four buck right under my tree. Um, the smallest one was a small eight point and he was smelling my, my climbing sticks. And, uh, the big one was three steps from my tree stand. One of them was behind me. And of course, you know, you can't move, you can't breathe. And Mm -hmm. uh, I was just a wreck. I I, I know what you're going through. Yeah. I, I tried um, if you're a, if you're a, if you're a deer hunter, you, you know, that feeling, I suppose to, to equate it to, um, you know, relic hunting or, or metal detecting when, when you like, like the day I found that, that gold ring, I, I flipped that, uh, that plug over and I seen that gold ring sticking out halfway and I just jumped out, you know, I just jumped back and my buddy seen me jumping. he he jumped up as quick as I did. And he comes over, he says, man, it must be something good. <laughs> I, I said, check it up. I don't know what it is, but it looked gold to me. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what I felt like in that tree that day, many days. Uh, but you know, really, um, the, the, the biggest moments that stand out to me is any morning when the sun comes up, um, any evening when the sun's going down, 
the birds are singing, the turkeys come in to roost, you know, I love God's creation. I mean, I'm a, uh, if you know me or get on my page or follow me, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a pretty outspoken Christian. Um, I, I don't, uh, I don't bash anybody with it at all, but, um, I can sit there and enjoy God's creation, you know, all day long. I can sit in a tree and just enjoy that so much. Yeah. Uh, yep. Hey guys, so we've got real we've got Rick Ward on the line. What's going on tonight, Rick? Hi, <laughs> Rick. <laughs> You're going to get tired of me <laughs> calling in all the time. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good, Loy. Uh, Charles, I got to tell you, I was just listening to that last part about you know being in pretty much an outspoken Christian and, and being out in God's country. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm a big hunter. I, I hunt with air rifles, but, um, yep. the, the thing about being out there and hunting, you don't always have to let go of that arrow. You don't always have to squeeze the trigger and, you know, just, just watching, you know, just watching things move yep. and how they move is, is really, really awesome to, to be out in the woods and, and to experience yep. that kind of thing because, so many people never get to do it. Um, you know, my question, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I was, uh, was going to say, that's what really, you go ahead, Rick. <laughs> I'm sorry. The, the delay. Um, I, my question was, have you ever got to hunt with Ted Nugent? Because he is a avid bow hunter and he's a really cool dude. I see him out at shot show quite a bit. Yeah, so uh, Ted Nugent, I don't know if everybody knows, most people probably do. He's he's from Michigan. Um, his yep. his property here in Michigan is just about an uh, hour and 20 minutes south of me probably. But um, uh, So I never hunted with Ted, um, but he did he did call me up here a year or so ago and, and uh, talked to me one morning and uh, really, really was a highlight for me. You know, I, I like Ted. He's, he's done a lot for, for hunting and for, um, different sportsmen's rights and, and second amendment rights and stuff like that. Um, and absolutely. so I like Ted. I like his music. I, um, when I, when I was younger and into the rock and roll thing, I, I liked his music. I still do. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, so he's yeah, that was interesting. So we we shoot texts back and forth now and then, you know, and, and just say hi and and uh, and he, yeah, he's, that's pretty he's, cool. He's, that, that that is real cool. Yeah, that'd be a lot of fun to uh, to hunt with him. I think I think he would be probably so intense it'd almost be hard to <laughs> <laughs> be like that giant buck walking out in front of you. You know, <laughs> I'd, but, rather, I'd rather yeah. have the buck. I tell you what, Ted Nugent is a wild man. He is, yeah. He is. I don't think. But now he's a great guy. He's to keep up with, I think. Hey, guys, we've got yeah. a uh, – thank you for the call, Rick. Uh, we've you got bet. a – Good night, guys. Okay, see you. Good night, Rick. We've got a uh, another call on. Denny Morrison, what's going on, Mr. Ring Finder? Oh, Hello, Ring Finder, Denny. these guys. Uh, got a question for you, Charles. Yes, sir. Uh, what kind of metal detector do you use up near Black Lake? Um, I, whichever one I got, uh, I use my dais up there. I use my, my Tesoro up there. Um, yeah. you, you're familiar with Black Lake up there in, in Onaway? I am because you were talking about the, uh, wooden steering wheels and that's where Henry Ford got his wooden, wooden steering wheels and the spokes. Yep. You're absolutely right. So yeah. Yeah. I knew you played around up here in Michigan, but I didn't know if you knew that part. So uh, yeah. Um, that's, that's up in Parkdale County. Um, uh, actually, the 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 camp I hunt uh, is is bordered on one side by the Lazy Boy property that um, the Lazy Boy Chair uh, Company owns. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those. Uh, yeah. So my buddy up there, him and his boy, they run AT Max, and they they cleaned up. Uh, listen to this. My buddy's son, he's, he's in his early forties. I think he got an AT max last year, his first year with a, I think he found nine V nickels up there. <laughs> we find them all the time in Ohio. You know, those big deer yeah. you got up there, they eat down here in Ohio <laughs> and they run up there. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, no, you guys, you you guys in Ohio, I don't know what you got going on there as far as metal detecting. You're in uh, and and deer hunting. You guys got you got some monster deer down there. Wow, Charles, yeah. I I hate to tell you this, you're so far up in Michigan, you're starting to sound like a Canadian. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Ain't nothing hey, wrong Danny. with that, is he, Allison? <laughs> hey, Denny, I think I think uh, Charles and I, uh, you ought to hook us up with a, a good deer hunting site in Ohio. I don't I don't deer hunt, but I usually have at least a hundred behind my house while I live on a creek, and you, in the winter time you can see them herding up back there. So we got a lot of deer, mm-hmm. turkey, you name it. Just play us out a good shooting lane, and we'll be fine. <laughs> so they're all, if you come yeah. to Hancock County, we got them. Trust me. Yeah, yeah. There's some good hunting down in Ohio for sure. I got I got quite a few friends down that way. Uh, you know, Ohio, you got the good metal detecting, uh, all different kinds of metal detecting. You got beautiful relic hunting for the arrowheads and all that. You got the good the deer hunting. It's it's a it's a pretty good spot, you know. You know what, Charles, uh, last week I actually hunted a, a house site that I have in the farmer where I hunted at and myself, neither one of us have his home site on any maps we have from the 1800s, none. Mm. So, mm-hmm. But he found it out there. He found uh, shards of uh, stone, I mean, uh, pottery and things like that. And I got an 1864, or 63, excuse me, fatty Indian head penny out of there and he got several buttons and we have only hit just a portion of it so far. And I hate to say this in the next seven days it's gonna rain. <laughs> uh, bummer. You you found that just by just by the debris in the plowed field? Right. And yeah. you know how you talk about standing in a field but that's what we were doing and way back by this woods and we counted uh twenty three twenty three deer watching nice. us. <laughs> yeah. it's pretty cool it's a beautiful place yeah. so yeah he's, yeah, put, me on, he's put me on the four sites one of them is a 1910 schoolhouse that they moved a wooden one so we've got to hit that yet before the farmers get in the field yeah sounds like we yeah. all need to go up yeah. there and hip you guys with all of that because they have <laughs> that's those what, uh, that's what it sounds like they have those ohio wheaties all those large cents it's, it's just wrong i tell you <laughs> i've been hunting yeah, in the middle Lord. we get hot half times and, and on the dais is really crazy last year in ohio they found five gold gold coins with the dais last year in ohio so yeah actually was gonna, i was gonna try to hunt with um uh, Tim Glick, you know, a lot of you guys know him. He, yeah, he, I I know, him. that'll be paired up with his dais. Yeah. Down there. Yeah. There's yeah. a few dais swingers down there for sure. For sure. Well, that's just the questions I had. If you got somebody else, Roy, I'll jump off of here. Okay. Thanks for the call, yeah. Denny. Thanks. Appreciate Good it. Program, Charles. Thanks for the call, Denny. Appreciate it. That's, uh, that's cool that you know about Black Lake. That's a, that's a pretty good spot up there. I love it up there. Yep. Yeah. I was wanting to know where you got the mushrooms at. I know they're up there. You're not going to tell me, though, but they're big. <laughs> <laughs> There's some baskets of them. <laughs> they're in the woods, and they're around the beach trees. That's where they're at. Hey, thanks for, the, yeah, thanks for the call, Denny. Talk to you <laughs> yep, later. Uh, so, uh, and Woody Jones asked uh, earlier, have you ever hunted for uh, Indian artifacts? Have you found any of those in your area? Um, I have actually, um, I'm finding a, an artifact, Indian artifact is, is kind of my nemesis, you know, it's, it's my way whale, I guess. Um, I found a lot of neat, uh, things out in the woods, uh, you know, natural finds and stuff like that. Um, I never, I never found a, uh, an arrowhead until, I moved into this house here. I've been here almost 17 years uh, in June. It will be 17 years. But um, I was going out. I ate, I ate my dinner one night, and I told my wife I was going to go for a shoot over in the woods. And uh, so I hopped off the deck with, with my bow and my, my stumping arrow, my stump shooting arrow. And I I had a limb hanging down, you know, w- w- right on the edge of the yard. So I let that arrow go, and, of course, 
arrow went out into the plowed field and I went over there and picked it up and started heading for the woods. I took about two steps after I picked that uh, arrow out of the ground and there lays a beautiful arrowhead laying right there. And Oh my goodness, I just about went crazy. Ran back to the house, showed my wife and my, my little baby daughter at the time. And um, we looked at that and of course I go back over to the woods and started shooting, shooting a bowl. But uh, as, as I'm sitting here talking to you guys right now, my buddy, Kevin, um, we were going to try to hunt today, but he ended up having to um, call it off. He had training for work. He had to go to, um, uh, we were going to metal detect up here, but, uh, he's, he went home and went to his, his field and he found a bunch of arrowheads. So he's, he's sitting here texting me pictures right now. And, uh, <laughs> I'm not looking at him. I'm not looking at him. Though. I'm trying to pay attention to you guys. But uh, <laughs> he's, he's found some good ones up here. He's he's in a better area for it than I am. I'm kind of um, I'm I'm a little bit in the in the middle, you know, kind of a no man's land. I'm in between the rivers and and that sort of thing. So uh, they are here. Obviously, I found one 100 yards from the house, but um, where he's at, he's got some fields, and he he goes out and picks up a few every time he hits that field. So. We've got a bunch in our area, me and Jeff do, and we occasionally <laughs> accidentally find one, you know, when we're digging holes after a signal. Used mm-hmm. to, whenever they uh, turn the ground, it, you know, they'd turn it whenever they get ready to plant corn or whatever and then dist it down. And then after you had a good rain, I mean, they just, there's nothing prettier than seeing an arrowhead just laying out on a pedestal of uh, of dirt there, you know, nothing uh, to compare. Yeah, yeah. I got it in my hand right now. It sits up on my windowsill here in my shop, a little uh, translucent blue trade bead um, that I got out of a hole when I was digging a digging a fine uh, last fall. It's um, you know just a, just a little seed bead. Or it's, it's bigger than a seed bead, I guess, just a little trade bead. Um, but it's, uh, you know, that's, that's from our Indian uh, ancestors here. Uh, yeah, I we know, have the, the, uh, the I, I just point. I don't remember what the coin was. I I was looking for that, and I seen the blue thing, and I just, of course, it's all muddy, and so I just threw it in the pouch because it it was a unique color, and brought it home, cleaned it up, turned out to be a you know a trade bead. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And CR, uh, of course, down here uh, when they uh, plant tobacco, they still plow the field, but. If they plant corn or soybean, they do a no-till, and of course, it's it's really hard to find a good place to uh, hunt for uh, Indian arrowheads anymore. And right now, I've got a couple of camps that it has cattle on it, and you follow the cattle path to where they just, after it rains, they'll walk through there, and you'll find a lot of arrowheads then. So, yeah. the um, the the year when I found that arrowhead here, it was sitting right on a furrow. Um, like somebody placed it there, you know, and, uh, I was like, man, I'll be tearing this field up now. And, uh, then the, the field changed farmers and the, the new farmers, they don't plow no more. So that field ain't been plowed since. Yeah. And, uh, so that broke my heart, but I found a beautiful scraper on a, on a cow trail out in Wyoming when I was out there uh, antelope hunting one year, I was tracing up this cow trail heading back to my camp and, uh, had my bow up over my shoulder and, and uh, I could see it. I was going up a little incline, and boy, it just started reflecting. And I had already found. Do um, you, you know what a teepee ring is? Where they used to put the rocks around the the bottom of the teepee, I guess. Yeah. I I was uh, putting a stalk on an antelope, and and uh, I I found those teepee rings, and and then I found a an outcropping of you know some sort of I, I'm not a good rock identifier, but I I knew this was a I could see where they had been knocking spalls off these big boulders for, you know, napping heads. And uh, so that got me thinking about it. And then on the way back to camp, I see the sun glinting off this, this rock right in the middle of the cow trail. And boy, I picked it up and it was just a beautiful circular uh, scraper. And uh, that was a real good find for me. Well, I'll tell you what, you've been a wonderful guest. You got any more questions, Jeff? No, I'm I'm fresh out of them. I guess everybody's asked the questions that I wanted to hear. So, uh, appreciate you coming on with us, Charles. You're a very interesting individual, and uh, you were a great guest. I mean, we couldn't ask for more, could we, Jeff? 
No, we couldn't. I mean, it, we went from uh, treasure hunting to making bows, and, of course, all of it is part of nature. So, I mean, I love the bow part. Yeah. Off off yep. the grid and everything else, too. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I uh, I just appreciate you guys reaching out to me, and and I I want to make sure I put the half redneck on that list too. You know, he's yeah. Mark's a Mark's a great guy, and we I think Mark and I touched base uh, somewhere a year or so ago, and um, we we've chatted a few times on and off since then. But um, he's he he's a good guy, and you're right. You got a you got a good booking agent right there. So. Um, <laughs> Not not saying because he booked me, but because he's he's had some dandy guests on here, and I want to. While I'm thinking about it, uh, your guest, uh, I can't remember what if it was last week or the week before. Uh, Greg uh, Perkins, is it? Perkins, um, yeah. That guy, he yep, that was he had me he had me riveted, man. He, that guy's found some cool stuff, so yep. I really enjoyed listening to him. Uh, but you guys are good. I I like I like your stories and. Uh, uh, you and Jeff do a great job, and I appreciate you having me on. Well, well we really appreciate it. Yeah, we do. And hang on the line there. Uh, we'll close the show out and uh, then uh, be back with you in just a little bit. Hey, guys, if you like podcasts like this, be sure and check out Beyond Sat and Sound with Josh Kimmel on Sunday night and Wednesday night at 8 o'clock Eastern. And then All Metal Mode is on Monday night with Mike Hare and Gypsy Jewels, and that's at 8 o'clock Eastern. Obviously, I am on with American Digger Relic Roundup on Monday night with Butch Holcomb and Jeff Lupert. That's Monday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. Hardcore Metal Detecting with Derek Asklar and Craig Talley has a show every Thursday night and Saturday night at 8 o'clock Eastern. And XP Team USA with Dave Kimmel and Grant Hansen. They're on every other Friday night. And obviously, me and Jeff will be right back here next Thursday night. And uh, keep listening because, and keep watching Relics Radio Facebook group page because we're going to inform you about the details of getting in on this contest for the Amphib- Amphibio giveaway real soon. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on Relics Radio. We really do appreciate it. Be sure and join us live each Thursday night at 7 o'clock Central Time, 8 o'clock Eastern here on Spreaker. Or you can catch the archive show at Relics Radio on Spreaker, iHeartRadio, iTunes, and many other podcast outlets. Relics Radio is also syndicated on GoodTalkRadio.com and has a show each Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. Arizona time. Please take a minute and hit the like button and be sure and follow us so that you'll get notifications of all of our upcoming broadcasts. You can also find us on YouTube at Digging with 7 or Tennessee Jeff, or you can check us out on our Relics Radio Facebook group page or Adventures in History on Facebook. If you'd like to get in touch with us, then send an email to relicsradio at outlook.com. We'd love to hear from you. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And until then, get out there and dig some history.